<laughs> All right, we move on now to healthcare. How would you address the current problems in our healthcare system, including policies to weaken Obamacare, access to health care for those who cannot afford insurance or face unaffordable premiums, deductibles, and co-pays, and finally escalating outrageous pharmaceutical costs. How are you going to address those problems? So the paradigmatic example of Scott Perry is that in November of 2018, he wrote an op-ed in the Patriot News where in paragraph number one, he promised to protect coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. The Pre-Existing Conditions Coverage Act comes to a vote on the House floor in 2019, votes against it. That's Scott Perry, and this has been his political mantra for his entire career in Congress, is making it more difficult for people to have health care. And the one thing that that bill would do is what was originally envisioned under the ACA in the first place, which is provide public navigators who would help people navigate the healthcare marketplace, which is difficult. Uh, and so I think that's one thing we can do initially to reform the ACA. Um, I would also like us uh, to provide a robust public option for people to enroll in Medicare, regardless of their station in life. It would take the burden off of small businesses. It would be particularly beneficial for uh, low-income communities. And that would put us on a glide path toward eventually getting to single payer, hopefully by 2030, which would streamline the efficiency of healthcare in our country. Um, and for pharmaceuticals, the one policy platform that we've proposed uh, looks at what happens with our taxpayer-funded money. And so the last 200 drugs that have been brought to market in the United States were done either in whole or in part on the back of NIH funding for research and development. That's our money. The National Institute of Health is using taxpayer-funded money to develop pharmaceutical drugs that private companies can then go sell at whatever price they want. And so our proposal was to cap any pharmaceutical drug that is brought to market in the United States on the back of taxpayer-funded research and development, because then we would get a return on the very investment that we're putting in in the first place. Thank you. Eugene. Thank you, Joyce. <clears throat> If there is an issue that I take most personally in this campaign, it is healthcare and particularly pre-existing protections. I had a brother with muscular dystrophy. We found out when I was a freshman in high school that he had that dreaded disease. We were never able to get health insurance for him. When I was a first year night law student, I got the phone call that he had gone into cardiac arrest and had died. And I described earlier about my dad's situation to compound the family disaster. My dad was actually incarcerated at the same time he had to come to my brother's funeral in shackles. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, with all its strengths and weaknesses, I had thought at that moment that at least families would not have to go through what we went through. The federal government kept, could not prevent my brother from dying, but it could prevent insurance companies from denying insurance based on a pre-existing condition. Scott Perry wants to take us back to the dark ages on this, and I take that very personally. I will fight to protect the most vulnerable in our society with everything I've got, because I've been there at the funeral when that happens. When it comes to prescription drugs, I've audited the pharmacy benefit managers and the scam that they are making billions of dollars in Pennsylvania. I will go to DC, I will fight to reform that system as well, and the cleanest thing we can do to bring down the cost of prescription drugs, we have a Medicare Part D program in the United States. The Bush administration used it as a giveaway to big pharma. We need to give Medicare the ability to buy prescription drugs at bulk rates, allow the federal government to negotiate. That will bring down the price immediately. Thank you. You guys are doing a good job sticking to the time limits. Excellent. <laughs> All right. We move on now to national security. Please explain strategies and actions that would that you would support to ensure our national security, including the problems of rogue nations like Iran, North Korea, 
developing nuclear arms, the continued spread of terrorist ideologies in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and the rest of the world. Challenging in two minutes, but we're both going to give it up. <laughs> the number one thing we need to do is rebuild our alliances across the world. That's number one. And for countries we disagree with, we have to have open and frank dialogue with them, whether it's treaties, whether it's through one-on-one -on -one dialogue, or through organizations like the UN. And the idea that we would walk away from NATO in this administration is literally beyond words. So that's number one. We have to rebuild our alliances, and we have to rebuild the discussions we have with countries that may be adversaries. Number two, we have to all work. When I say all, meaning not just people in this room, but the whole world benefit from nuclear non-proliferation. We, we have to work collectively with other countries to stop the spread of nuclear proliferation to make sure that our world is safer across the board. Number three, when it comes to terrorist organizations. Again, that is something that we cannot do that alone as the United States. We have to work with other countries throughout the world in a sense like a police action. After September 11th, there was actually this brief moment, as horrible as that day was, where actually there was international cooperation on stopping the spread of terrorism. We need to have that same spirit on stopping international terrorism because nobody wins when innocent people are killed through terrorist action. And another thing that is, in my view, absolutely critical, and that is we have to do a better job in the United States of being a voice of freedom and decency and civility. We are leaders in the world. And when people see the United States not being a good actor, they lose confidence. We need to go back to being that good actor, to being what we can control ourselves, which is how do we behave as a government, to being a voice of reason, a voice of civility, to try to bring more decency across the world. It will be hard, but it is something that absolutely must happen. Thank you very much, Tom. Just recently, uh, the doomsday clock was um, moved to 100 seconds to midnight. It has never before reached 100 seconds to mid midnight, not even during October of 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the one story that Robert Kennedy told after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62 to demonstrate the importance of our allies was to show that um, during the naval quarantine that was set up once we found out that the Russians had put nuclear uh, warheads on, uh, on our border, um, we reached out to our allies in Guinea and in Darkour, and both of them prevented Russian tankers from refueling on their way to Cuba. And what Robert Kennedy said then was, but for our allies and the trust that we had built with, our, um, uh, with other countries around the world, there might have been a nuclear war. That's the importance of having allies. And one of the first things that President Trump did when he took office was to back out of the INF nuclear treaty with Russia which took 50 years of consistent foreign policy from President Truman to President Reagan. It marked the end of the Cold War. It marked the end of nuclear proliferation in Europe. And now Vladimir Putin is testing hypersonic nuclear weapons. We can at least encourage President Trump to stay in the New START Treaty, which is the last remaining uh, nuclear arms agreement that we have with Russia. Um, but President Trump has not signaled a willingness to, to do that. And we've also signaled now a willingness to deploy uh, low capacity nuclear arms. Once we go down that road, then the response will be nuclear arms. And so what Congress can do is use the power over the purse to defund the deployment of uh, any nuclear arms, um, whether foreign or domestic. Uh, because as President Kennedy said, World War uh, III will be fought with sticks and stones. Um, because once there's a nuclear war, that's it. Um, and Congress can reinstate itself as the one entity that can prevent that from happening. Thank you. You guys have had easy questions up to now. Let me give you a tough one. <laughs> now we're on to immigration, all right? What would be the components of a comprehensive immigration policy that you could support? Now please include your positions on the following issues in your response. DACA, amnesty, asylum, the border wall, and family separation. Tom. 
So I think DACA represents the very best of what we can be as Americans. It's giving children who came to this country on the simple idea of hope the chance to get ahead. And I think it's one of President Obama's most lasting uh, legacies is to give these children a chance to actually make their way up in the United States. Um, amnesty, I believe that we need a pathway to citizenship. And I think the single thing that is most, uh, that is missing the most from all of our policy, not just immigration, is the idea of compassion. And so when these people come to our country, they're fleeing oppression and famine and poverty and war, and the very least we can do is provide them with a path to citizenship in the United States. Asylum is something that I saw as a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, we need to provide these people who are facing the potential of returning to those countries with a path for recourse here in the United States. And our immigration judges are overworked. They don't have the capacity to deal with the caseloads that they're facing right now. And in many ways, this is a self-inflicted wound. Uh, and so one of the things that President Obama did before he left office was to allocate $450 million to the country of Guatemala, which was suffering from a massive famine, and in fact, still is. President Trump put that money on hold and then withdrew $200 million of it. And now we have the largest influx of Guatemalan immigrants in American history. This is by design. And to say that we can put up a border wall as a solution, I think reflects exactly what we need to fix in this country. And so we can use humanitarian aid to prevent the influx of immigration in the first place, and then once people come into our country, have a compassionate platform that gives them a chance to acclimate themselves in the United States. Thank you. Eugene. Thank you. As Auditor General, I've helped the powerful accountable. But also, I have found ways to bring people together for solutions that can improve the lives of our state. And this is one area where we have to build bridges to bring people together to improve not only the lives of the people in our country, but to improve our security and make us a beacon of freedom again. Do we need secure border? The answer is of course, absolutely. But we also need a just immigration system. We need to have enough immigration judges, so people that are trying to come into our country are able to follow an appropriate process to do that. We also have people that are here undocumented. We need to have a fair system here so that there is a path to citizenship for that nearly 11 million people that are here now. As Auditor General, I audited the Berks Detention Center. It is critical to understand that the children there and the families that are there are asylum seekers. I held the Trump administration and INS accountable during that audit. The idea, and again, it is amazing when I think about the current state of the Republican Party, and Scott Perry in particular. President Reagan talked about our nation as a city on the hill, where we would want to be that beacon of freedom across the world. I know President Kennedy, almost every president talked about us in that way. However, at the Burks Detention Center, we have families seeking asylum, being held in what is in fact a prison, not giving them the opportunity for a fair hearing to determine if their asylum process is worthy for them to stay in the United States. This is something that we need to build bridges across the ideological spectrum to make sure that we have a secure border and a fair immigration process. And for the asylum seekers that are out there, we need to make sure that they are getting a fair hearing to determine if their fleeing injustice is something that needs to make sure that they stay in the United States. And for the undocumented, a path to citizenship so we can make sure that the people that need to stay here can stay here. Okay, thank you. Good government. What type of good government and anti-corruption measures would you support to address the rampant corrupting influence of money in politics? Eugene. As the Auditor General, part of my job is taking on corruption. We find over a billion dollars wasted by Harrisburg. We've taken, you know, regardless of party, I mean, I took on the Scranton School District. We find some of the most corrupt school bus contracts in the entire state of Pennsylvania there even though they were all Democrats. Some people in that district now are going to prison because of the fight I took on regardless of political party. 
and clearly when it comes to how we operate as a federal government, the biggest thing that needs to be changed is Citizens United needs to be overturned. That Supreme Court decision was a disaster for our country. There is something that is, was passed by the House and is now sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. And I will clearly support this if I'm your member of Congress and we have the opportunity to vote on it, which is ending dark money in our politics and overturning Citizens United. But we don't control the five votes on the Supreme Court, but we can change the campaign finance laws in this country to get dark money out of the system and have more accountability to who's donating, not just the candidates, but the party committees all across the United States. That is something that can be done and must be done to restore people's faith in our democracy. When I was a state house member, I became the first legislator to post my expenses online. I know how to bring the political parties together. You know how I did it that day? By unifying 202 of legislators against me. They were all upset at me for posting my expenses. <laughs> sometimes, you, sometimes you gotta take, the, take some punches in this. But as a result of me doing that, just as a naive first year, first day state lawmaker, today, every state lawmaker must make their expenses available either online or through email. And that's the same type of approach I will take to any reform that'll make our government more transparent and more honest. Those fights need to be taken on and I will do that every single day. Um, so I think this is one of the bigger differences between Eugene and me. Um, we can talk about Citizens United, but you have to run on a platform that doesn't take corporate money to have credibility to actually say it. And so Eugene's taken corporate money his whole career. Pfizer, Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, Pico, Sunoco, pp &L. I mean, go down the list. Democracy's broken for a reason. And that's because we have politicians running for office who refuse to step back and not take corporate money. Yeah. And that's what we've done. And so we're running on a platform that is transparent from the get-go. Not asking you to trust me when I get in there, but running it from a campaign standpoint to say, we need to get money out of politics and I'm gonna help you do it. Uh, from another good government standpoint, um, Eugene voted with Scott Perry for the unconstitutional gerrymandering bill. You know, he talks hard about fighting against corruption. Where was the fight there? On the one issue that deprived Democrats of equal representation in government for a decade. That's why we're in this situation is because we didn't have politicians stand on principle at the very moment when we really needed it. And that's why we have polarization. That's why all of us in this room have Scott Perry. That's why the Supreme Court, thankfully, was able to overturn that law and give us, finally, some equal representation in government. But good government today is priority number one. Because 84% of Americans don't trust politicians, and Donald Trump is the President of the United States. There is a criminal operation in the White House. We need people who run on principle. We need to get money out of politics, and we need to, need to prioritize the fact that we can give people an equal say in their representation. Thank you. Because you mentioned the Auditor General, he now gets a chance to respond. 30 seconds. You can look at my entire tenure in public life and see, regardless of who donates to me, I take on the tough fights. When I was elected Auditor General, I did the first audit of the fracking industry in the United States. Because of that audit, the Corbett administration had to hire 55 new inspectors to hold the frackers accountable. That's my record. I did the first ever audit of climate change in the United States, finding over $200 million impacted taxpayers because of the state of Pennsylvania's inaction on climate change. And I wanna be absolutely clear about this. It was my legislation that would have created the nonpartisan commission styled after Iowa. And it was a failure on leadership of both parties to take that up. Citizens should not be having the voter or the politicians pick them. The voters should be picking the politicians. Okay. We now look at the environment. What is your strategy for addressing global warming, including fracking, carbon tax, 
Assistance to Victims and Differential Treatment of Low-Income Americans. Tom. So our campaign has endorsed the Green New Deal because it's the ultimate question of our time. President Trump has rolled back 92 environmental regulations since he took office. He backed out of the Paris Climate Accord. He's pouring jet fuel on an inferno. We have 10 years here to actually fix this problem, to actually see if we can achieve a 1.5 degree increase in industrial uh, or in global temperatures above industrial levels by 2050. The Green New Deal is the place to start. Eugene supports the expansion of fracking and the continuation of petrochemical plants, which will be the single largest uh, industry in the oil and gas field by 2050. It will eliminate all the progress that the city of Pittsburgh has made on air pollution. And as I mentioned earlier, we had 3,000 premature deaths caused by air pollution last year, the most in the country. To continue the very problem that put us in this position, we don't have the luxury today. We simply don't. Uh, and, and the fact that Donald Trump is making this problem infinitely worse by the day means that we need to be as bold as humanly possible. Uh, and so to your question about um, a carbon tax, I think a carbon tax is a great idea, but I'd like to expand it. I'd like for it to be a climate pollution fee. And so it's not just carbon, but it's methane. It's any pollutant that enters our environment that uh, not only is, is taxed, but is, um, a fee is imposed, and then that money is given back to the low-income communities who are harmed the most by climate change. Uh, and so that we can actually have an environmental justice aspect of our policy. But uh, I want to reiterate, the Green New Deal is the only way forward and the only way to actually save ourselves from a real catastrophe. And I'm proud to be the only candidate that supported it. Thank you. Eugene? When I was elected state legislator, one of the first bills I introduced was the Alternative Energy Investment Act. When I first introduced it, it was pretty much only Democrats that sponsored the legislation. But unlike some people that get into their ideological corner and don't talk to anyone that disagree with them, I worked tirelessly with people that agreed and disagreed with me. So when that bill was signed into law by Governor Rendell, not only did every Democrat vote for it, but over 80 Republicans. That legislation, now known as the Alternative Energy Investment Act, made Pennsylvania a leader in wind energy east of the Mississippi. When I ran for Auditor General, it was in opposition to Tom Corbett's position on fracking. I voted against his giveaway to the fracking industry, and I said on day one, I would order an audit of all the frackers to make sure that our water was being protected. And you can Google Eugene D. Pasquale and fracking, and you will see I have been their toughest opponent. When it comes to moving forward, we clearly need to address climate change as the crisis it is. We need to move aggressively for alternative energy, move by 2050 and hopefully dramatically soon for zero net carbon emissions. This, I believe, will not only clean our air and clean our water, but the air quality in South Central Pennsylvania is some of the dirtiest in the United States and the Susquehanna River is one of the most polluted rivers in the country. But I believe doing this right will actually create millions of new jobs. Many people that are frustrated right now by what's happened to their manufacturing job, I believe we can put them back to work to create a vibrant green economy for the future. That is my record and that is my plan. And we need to work with all parties to get this done. Thank you. We now take up the issue of income inequality. I think it's starting with you, Eugene. How would you address income inequality, including creation of living wage jobs and jobs of the future, the tax structure, job training, and guaranteed annual income. Thank you. There is clearly a problem with income inequality across the United States. There's clearly a problem. A couple things we can do right off the bat. Some easier, some harder. Number one, the, the minimum wage at the federal level needs to be increased to $15 an hour. We need to reward work and reward people that are sometimes working one, two, and maybe even three jobs to try to put dinner on their table for their families. And it is also clear to make, make it clear 
that when you make, when I say raise the minimum wage, that doesn't just apply to people that are on the minimum wage now, but anyone that is below $15 an hour will also get an increase. That's number one. Number two, our tax code is entirely unfair. We need to reward the middle class and working families and not have the Donald Trump giveaway and the Scott Perry giveaway to the ultimate, to the ultra rich. By reforming our tax code, and even President Reagan said, the earned income tax credit is the best tool to fight poverty. Increasing the minimum wage and enhancing and expanding the earned income tax credit will be two efforts to dramatically fight poverty and in income inequality. Another item we need to do, and I'm going to keep harping on this because it's important. We need to improve education across the board in the United States. Put more resources into our public schools. The best long-term way to fight income inequality is to make sure that people, have, everyone has access to quality, affordable education. Also important, we need to make college more affordable. I, I believe that our public universities should be free. At a minimum, we need to do what some other states have done, which is anyone that gets a B average or in the top 15% of their class gets to go to a public university in their state for free. And as, the audit, as I've done on my audits of workforce development, clearly we need to do a better job of retraining people when their job is lost. We need to find better ways to get people trained for the jobs of the future. You do all of that, and then we will put a major dent in income inequality in the United States. Thank you, Tom. Here's one stat to describe everything that's wrong with our economy. Last year, for the first time in American history, billionaires paid a lower effective tax rate than the middle class. Think about that. The 75 wealthiest companies in the United States didn't pay any income tax. Facebook, Google, Netflix, Amazon, trillions of dollars, none of it goes back to us. It's the middle class who's footing the bill for the entire country. And because no one has a chance to get ahead in society today, they've actually created a new class of poverty to describe how most Americans live. Uh, because 65% of Americans die in debt. And it goes by the acronym ALICE, which means asset limited, income constrained, but employed. Asset limited means that the median retirement account balance is zero dollars in this country. Most people rent their homes or lease their cars. They have no equity. Income constraint means that wages haven't risen with inflation in the better part of 30 years. So you can't afford a lifestyle on a middle class salary of uh, rent, transportation, a cell phone, health care, and child care. But you have a job. You have a side hustle. You don't get to see your kids. You don't have any retirement savings. Chances are you'll die in debt. Our entire economic system needs an overhaul. And that begins with asking the 75 wealthiest corporations in the United States to pay their fair share. Uh, and beyond that, looking to the future, in the next 12 years, automation is going to take over a third of our economy. We need to prepare the next generation through education with the job training they need to enter the workforce uh, for the next several decades. And we can do that through free, free two-year programs, free apprenticeships, free uh, trade school opportunities, so that we, we have a new generation entering the workforce with a chance to participate in the economy. Thank you. LGBTQ rights, that's our next topic. The Trump administration has initiated changes in federal policy towards transgender individuals across both federal agencies and the military that decrease protections for this population. This occurs at a time when crimes directed toward transgender people increase 34% from 2017 to 2018. What will you do to protect the rights and safety of all Americans? and reverse the changes in federal policy that discriminate against the transgender community in particular. Tom. So the fact that the LGBTQ community still lacks civil rights in this country, I think is a, a perfect example of what's lacking in our society. And Scott Perry was presented with an opportunity to vote for this bill. And instead of doing it, he called it the Inequality Act. 
He doubled down and said that no, LGBTQ community does not deserve civil rights. They don't deserve an opportunity to not be discriminated against when they apply for a mortgage, or they apply to school, or they want to get a loan. We shouldn't give that to them. Uh, and, and if there's anything in society that reflects why Scott Perry needs to go, it's that. And I mentioned earlier, this idea of compassion, the idea that try, we're trying to help people who need a hand, uh, and the LGBTQ community um, needs civil rights protection in this country, and the Equality Act for me is, is the way to do it. Um, and I also think, educationally, we can start at the ground level. And we see this now with the next generation of, uh, of children who are coming through, who are much more open um, to uh, the LGBTQ community, to other minorities, um, because they have grown up in a different world. Um, and I think incentivizing that and uh, allowing for as many opportunities as possible for young people to express themselves openly without the fear of stigma uh, and to have a more compassionate and accepting world that allows young people to actually believe in themselves and not feel nervous about what society will view them to be, uh, I think is a, a really important thing too. But um, the Equality Act is uh, priority number one, and we need to get Scott Perry out because he voted against it. Thank you. Eugene. When I was elected to the State House, one of the first bills I co-sponsored was House Bill 300, which would have gave workplace protections across Pennsylvania. It is staggering that that is still not law in Pennsylvania. We not only not, we, are, we need that in Pennsylvania, and we need that across the entire country, which is why the Equality Act needs to be passed by the House, the Senate, and signed into law by the next president, because clearly it's not gonna happen in this term. Allowing people to be who they are, and making sure that they have equal protection under the law, and making sure that the federal government protects them along the way is one of the critical reasons why we need a fair federal government. And it doesn't just apply to how the workplace discrimination, also that is clearly an important issue. The federal government can have impact on banks, how loans are given for housing, community development block grant money, to make sure that we are using all the tools of the federal government to eliminate any type of discrimination to make sure that all Americans have access to those funds or to fair loans so they can buy a home and achieve their dreams. This administration has even gone down the wrong path, along with Scott Perry, on people who can serve in the military. Anyone that wants to serve their country, regardless of who they are, including anyone in the LGBTQ community, should be able to serve. Even active military members strongly disagree with the President and Scott Perry on this. As your member of Congress, I will fight for those protections in housing, fight for those protections in employment, and make sure that anyone wants to wear our uniform and defend our country has the right to do so. Thank you. Voting rights is the next topic. Given the Supreme Court's decision regarding the Voting Rights Act, what can be done to ensure that all American citizens are able to easily vote? Eugene. Thank you. The House, I think it's what's known as HR3, but the House of Representatives, along with a chunk of Republicans and every Democrat, has already passed, and it sits on the Senate desk, which would restore the Voting Rights Act. It is amazing how many bills are just sitting there in the Senate that Mitch McConnell will not bring up. But this is one of them. Restoring the Voting Rights Act is critical, not just in Pennsylvania, but in every state across the country, to make sure that everyone has the right to cast their ballot. I also think a pretty big chunk of what Governor Wolf has just enacted will also move us in the right direction. Voter registration going from 30 days out of an election to 15. I believe we should have same day registration in not only Pennsylvania, but across the United States. When I was a state legislator, I introduced early voting. Having one election day on Tuesday can be very challenging for working families, especially if you're a single parent that works an hourly job. That can be challenging on a presidential election where you have those long lines. So having more access 
having no excuse absentee balloting is a start, but we should have early voting as well. I believe we should have election day on a weekend, but that's probably a battle that I will never win. <laughs> but that's something that would increase voter turnout, because if you look in some other countries, they'll have voting on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to make sure that anybody has access to vote. Restoring the Voting Rights Act is critical. Also, going to same-day registration is critical. I believe we should have automatic voter registration. People, once they turn 18, should be registered to vote automatically. We should also have more polling places, early voting, and what Pennsylvania has done on no excuse absentee is a good start. We need to have that across the country as well. That will give everyone access to the ballot box so they can vote for the candidate they want. Thank you, Tom. The fact that voting is hard in this country, I mean, it, what a novel idea. We have Columbus Day. Why don't we swap that uh, and have Columbus Day no longer be a national holiday, but Election Day be a national holiday? That would be a good place to start. Voting should be the easiest thing you can do in this country. Uh, and it's not just the vote itself. And so, to go back to gerrymandering, one of the things that made it more difficult for uh, the cities of Harrisburg and New York to vote was that their cities were divided into three different districts. It diluted the black vote. Uh, and force people to even question what district they were voting to be a part of. And so it's not just equal access to the ballot, it's the more insidious forms of discrimination that make it harder to find equal representation uh, in, in Congress, both at the state level and at the federal level. Um, beyond that, uh, voting rights should be something that, um, you know, I've seen this now going through a lot of the high schools. We have voter registration teams at nine high schools, seven colleges, and two law schools. We've registered 1,000 students to vote so far. But what I see is a lack of civics in the schools. And just a basic understanding of three branches of government, state versus federal, a primary election versus a general election. It's not anybody's, uh, any one person's particular fault, but we need to teach young people the importance of being civically engaged and re-emphasize the basic foundations of democracy so that people enter uh, their um, post-educational careers with an understanding as to how democracy works. And I think bringing civics back to the forefront of our educational priorities is a good way to do that. Okay, thank you. You both will find this interesting. With some high schoolers yesterday in the conference, they all wanted the voting age to be lowered to 16. The teacher said that's ridiculous. <laughs> On to my favorite question. Women and family issues. Please address these issues affecting women voters. Equal pay for equal work. Paid family leave for parents and caregivers. Reproductive rights. Affordable child care. And sexual harassment in the workplace. Tom. So women today, on average, earn 80 cents to every man's dollar. But when you go down the list, it's even worse for African American women, who earn 61 cents to every white man's dollar. For Native American women, it's 58 cents for every white man's dollar. For Latino women, it's 55 cents for every white man's dollar. Discrimination is still very rampant at a gender level in this country. And I think prioritizing equal pay for equal work is a prerequisite to run for office today because we have to get the narrative out there that it is much harder for women today, even uh, with all the advancements that have been made, to have the same income levels that their male counterparts have. And so the EEOC at the federal level should be a watchdog. Any uh, company that takes federal money should have to comply with specific standards on equal pay. Um, in terms of uh, paid family leave, the United States is, one, is the only country out of the 41 developed countries who doesn't allow for paid family leave. We're last. And that should be for men and women. Uh, if you have a child, then again, it goes back to the idea of compassion. You're working for your family. You're not working for your employer. You're working to make yourselves uh, dignified and sustainable lives, and I think having the opportunity to go care for your children and having paid family leave policies is a uh, prerequisite now to make sure that there is equality. Reproductive rights, we all know that Scott Perry signed on to an amicus brief to overturn Roe v. Wade. Reproductive rights are back on the front line of attack in politics today, and so Democrats have an obligation 
to stand firm on principle and say that under no circumstance will we ever jeopardize a woman's right to choose. For starters, I have been endorsed by NARAL because of my 100% commitment for a woman and the right for her to choose her medical decisions on her body. Equal pay for equal work is absolutely essential. So obviously some important statistics that have just been cited. It's so insidious on this that even the women's national soccer team gets paid less than the men's, and the men never win anything. <laughs> I mean, and I know that that's not the most, uh, most important issue out there uh, when it comes to you know professional athletes, but that's how insidious it is. The women keep winning against the entire world the men can't even qualify for the tournament and still get paid more. That's crazy. It's just crazy. So we've got to have a dynamic shift on this where we reward everyone for equal work. And I think a critical reason why this happens is I think many women end up getting punished for having children, which is where the pay family leave comes in. What happens is you're mid-career and through a family decision decide to have children in a sense, getting punished on the career track for that. That's what happens. And it leads those women who then take some time to start raising the children, when they start entering back into the career, they have been punished for that. So paid family leave is critical to try to level the playing field for many women across the United States. And when it comes to access to health care, and still one of the most stunning quotes I have ever heard come out of an elected official's mouth. Scott Perry said, I'm tired of paying for women's health care. I've already had my kids. This November, we are going to send Scott Perry back. Yeah. Okay, I have one final question for both of our candidates. You should be organizing your thoughts for your questions. I think they're passing around the index cards now, so remember to write legibly or I won't be able to read it. All right, the final question. Whose turn is it? I think it's yours, Adrian, right? Who inspires you and why? So I'm a little bit on the inspiration one, a little bit of an odd duck on this stuff. You know, I'm into this crazy fitness stuff, so I. You know, I, I watch some of these David Goggin videos and stuff like that, so I'll Wim Hof, so I, I will spare you that, which is a whole different level, and I admittedly, I'm a little crazy on the fitness stuff and on the diet stuff, so just ignore my craziness on that if you can. Believe me, it helps me be more, have more energy and more effective for you every day as Auditor General and as your member of Congress. But the main reason on inspiration for me running is my kids and their future. I've got a 20-year-old who's a sophomore in college. He's studying the environment and music. I've got a daughter who is going to be, Lord willing, 17 in a couple weeks. Um, she wants to go to Temple and study the human brain. We have an obligation to make not just my kids, but all of our kids have a better world where we address climate change, bring more equality to our country, and have a fair, just economic system. So what inspires me is every day doing the best I can to fight for my kids, to be a better dad, to be a better person, a better leader, a better coach, and to try to be what, I put five little sticky notes on my bedroom window. One of them is, be the example. Practice what you preach. That is something that I try to live by. When, we go to the, when I go to these crazy Navy SEAL things where they run us through these gambits, you have to write your why. Why are you doing this? And usually the why that you have will dictate whether you are successful. And if you're in it for yourself, it's not going to work. But if, when you're in it for others, your path to success will likely be possible. So every day, I'm out there fighting, not just for my kids, but for the next generation so they can have a better world to live. Tom, your final question. My family inspires me. Um, my mom is a, a reading specialist. She was my Montessori school teacher growing up. She's an amazing person. Uh, 
She could do anything she wants, but the fact that she works with young students to improve their lives, uh, I think is the most inspiring thing there is. My, my dad's the type of person who if he sees a piece of trash on the ground, picks it up. He was a public servant his entire career. Actually, my parents met on a, on a, uh, on a campaign. They met on Governor Bob Casey's campaign in 1986 <laughs> because they had a passion for service. They had a passion for helping people. Uh, my brother Jim is, uh, is working in the city of Philadelphia right now, wanted to go into uh, city year, and is now working in business. Uh, and my brother Matt is training to be in the Army. I just have a great family. Uh, and every day I'm reminded of how lucky I am. The fact that I look back and you know, my, my parents, instead of taking us to Disney World, took us to Plymouth Meeting to learn about the Pilgrims. Uh, you know, on the way to school, we didn't listen to the radio. My dad told us about Eddie Rittenbacher and the World War I fighter pilot, and we had these history lessons on the way to school. I mean, just incredible people uh, who really just wanted to make the world a better place, and I think that uh, carried down to my brothers and me, um, and they're uh, my best friends, and they inspire me every single day. Thank you, thank you. Well, let's clap.